Let's pray. Father, I'm thankful that we have the opportunity to get into your word. And Father, I, I am so grateful that you have shared it with me so that I can share it with these people that you have brought here today. And So I just surrender before you and in front of them, recognizing that this is nothing that I've done on my own. And so I pray in the precious name and the blood of Jesus Christ that we would give you all of the honor, glory, credit, and praise for it's your word. It's your word. And so we're grateful for that because it's your word that changes our lives. Father, I pray that I would not be seen nor heard today, Father, but that you alone would be seen and heard working through me. God, I pray that our ears would be open and attentive, that our hearts would be made pliable, ready to receive, that we would not be hardened. God, that every burden would just be laid down right now, that every problem and care would just be let go of right now. Anything that would try to pull us away from receiving from you would just be taken away right now. And Father, that we would come with great joy and expectation that you change lives. And so, Father, we thank you that none of us are too far gone. In the precious name and the blood of Jesus Christ, all God's people said together, amen, amen, and amen. Let's give God a clap of praise. He's worthy of all praise. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Hallelujah. God is good. Amen. You know, if you're here and you do not have a good study Bible for yourself at home, See myself or one of the guys at the door when you leave. We want to give you one completely free of charge. You don't have to fill anything out. We just want you to have God's word because we know that's what he wants. We're going to pick up where we've left off. About a month ago, the Holy Spirit impressed upon me to begin teaching on the life of Joseph. And so I've just been listening to the voice of God, seeing what he wants me to share with all of you about the life of this man named Joseph. Um, pretty, pretty impressive how he always turned to God even in hard times. But then we also see a man, and uh, we saw a man in Joseph. There was a side of him that enough was enough. You may remember, and he tells the chief cupbearer when he's in prison, he says, I don't belong here, get me out of there. And we can all relate to that at some point if we're honest with ourselves in our lives where we've gone through a particular season, we've gone through a particular storm, and then we feel like, man, enough's enough. Enough's enough. But then if we're willing to ride that out and really see how God brought us through that for a reason, a plan, and a purpose, we were made better on the back side of it than we ever were on the front side of it. Amen? And so we need to learn how to be grateful for the training ground of God in our lives. So let's go there. We're going to get to the point to where we left off last week. Turn in your Bibles to Genesis 42. If you do not have a Bible with you right now, the verses will come up on the screen in just a moment. <clears throat> but we're going to pick up where we left off. You may remember Joseph has been called out of prison. Remember he was in there for something that he did not do. But God is training him. And now Pharaoh has called him out of prison so that Joseph can interpret the dreams of Pharaoh. And he does interpret the dreams, and the dreams come true because God gives revelation to Joseph. Genesis 42, verse 1. When Jacob, you may remember Jacob is the daddy to the 12 sons. When Jacob learned that there was grain for sale in Egypt, he said to his sons, why do you look at one another? And he said, behold, I have heard that there is grain for sale in Egypt. Go down and buy grain for us there that we may live and not die. So 10 of Joseph's brothers went down to buy grain in Egypt, but Jacob did not send Benjamin, Joseph's brother, with his brothers, for he feared that harm might happen to him. Thus the sons of Israel came to buy among the others who came, for the famine was in the land of Canaan. Now you can understand if you've been with us the past four Sundays, you understand why Jacob does not want his younger son leaving him. Jacob still remembers what happened over 20 years ago when he sent, at the time, his youngest son Joseph out to check on the brothers. And that decision that Jacob made was still having an effect on him 20 years later. Jacob has still not forgiven himself. The decision he made over 20 years earlier was still having an effect on how he lived 
or did not live. And his life in the present is now impacted because of it. Maybe there's someone in this room exactly like Jacob today. Maybe there's someone in here that's struggling with the exact same thing. Maybe you went through something in your past, and yes, it may have been huge. Yes, you may feel justified in how you feel with your emotions and your feelings and your decisions and your actions and reactions, but it should not be controlling you today. It should no longer be controlling your emotions. It should no longer have power over your decisions. It should not be bringing fear or hatred or resentment or anger into your heart and heart. But listen to me, friends. It's time to simply just let it go. It's time to simply let it go. Here's something to think about. Jacob didn't know his other sons had sold Joseph into slavery. Remember, they came back and they lied and they told him that his son was killed by a wild animal. Remember that? And so they came back and they lied. So Jacob has blamed himself thinking that it was his fault for sending Joseph out. This whole time, 20 plus years, Jacob is blaming himself thinking it was his fault. You may be busy blaming yourself for something that you're not even to blame for. I need you to hear that. You may be busy blaming yourself for something that you're not even to be blamed for. Jacob has two decades worth of blaming himself for something that he did not even do. So maybe, maybe this is your way of thinking. If I had just done this, anybody ever thought like that before? If, if I had just done this or if I had never gone there, how many people have thought that before? If, if I had just never gone there, it never would have happened. Or, or how about this one? What if I had never met them? If, if, if I had never met the person, if I had never met that group of people, then none of this would have ever happened this way. Listen to me. Stop blaming yourself. I want you to be encouraged today. Stop blaming yourself. It's time to move on with your life. Look at your neighbor and say, it's time to go. Look at someone else and say, it's time to go. It's time to move on with your life and begin to live in the freedom that God has for you today through Jesus Christ. It's time to just let it go. Genesis 42, 6. Now Joseph was governor over the land. and He was the one who sold to all the people of the land. And Joseph's brothers came and bowed themselves before him with their faces to the ground. You know, I just really feel like the Holy Spirit is just pressing upon me to tell someone this. There's someone in the room that is so angry that it's controlling your decision. You just need to stop. Give it to God and just let it go. God has much more freedom for you than what you're currently living in. And you're holding yourself in prison all the while the prison door is open. See, some of us get caught up like that, don't we, if we're, if we're honest to one another. Some of us get caught up in our own problems, our own emotions, and we have a pity party. And that pity party really is a cell. Well, the whole time we're, we, we, we treat ourselves and we view ourselves as a prisoner to the environment, a prisoner to the situation. And the entire time the prison door is wide open. It's not the door that's holding you back. It's your own self. All you have to do is get up and just leave. All you have to do is get up and just walk out. Nobody is holding you prisoner other than your own self. Just leave. Now, you may look right here. If you look back at the sixth verse, it says that the brothers come, and what do they do? They bow down. This is really interesting that the brothers come, and they bow down. Because you may remember in the very beginning, uh, about four weeks ago, when we first started on the life of Joseph, God showed Joseph some dreams that the brothers would bow down to him. And the scripture tells us, the text tells us that the brothers got so angry over that that they hated him even more. And so that's why they throw him in the pit. And that's why he's sold into slavery twice. And that's why he ends up in jail. Uh, all because... All because his brothers got angry over this dream. Now, guess what? The dream has now happened. 
Listen, when God says something's going to take place, there's not a man, woman, group that's going to stop it from going on. It's going to take place. And so his brothers just bow down to him. The plan of God is beginning to be fulfilled over two decades later. You've got to get a grip on that. Over two decades later, but here it is. Tell your neighbor, it takes time. It takes time. How many of you have ever driven by a Krispy Kreme and the light's on? <laughs> the fact that the light's on makes you want to pull in because you know that the donuts are hot and soft and you're even willing a grown person to stand there and watch them go through the conveyor belt. And they pop off at the end. And what do you do? Start all back over. As if something new is going to take place. We're mesmerized because like a gnat or a mosquito, we got drawn to that light. <clears throat> to the fluorescence. How many of you, let's just be real, how many of you have seen where the donuts get glazed and you've taken a notice to how much glaze is wasted. How many of you have ever wished that you could just lay there for like 10 minutes? <laughs> Isn't it something that we're, we're willing to wait for something that's good to us? When the light's not on, the donuts are there, they're just not what? It's not hot and fresh. They're still good. They're just not fresh. And we could go when the light's not on and there's no waiting, or we could go when the light's on and we get mesmerized in the waiting. And so what I've learned in life is we're willing to wait for what's good. Except sometimes when it comes to spiritual matters. Oh, God, I've been praying for so long for this. Oh, God, I haven't seen my miracle yet. Oh, God, why hasn't this been taking place? Oh, God, why haven't you fixed my marriage yet? Oh, God, why aren't my children saved yet? Oh, God, why haven't you provided yet? Oh, God, where's my new job at? Oh, God, oh, God, oh, God. But what if the tables were turned? What if we looked up to heaven and there was this great big fluorescent light bulb? And when the light bulb was on, we knew that God is saying, I'm at work, then oh, how much more greater faith it would cause the church to have when we looked up and saw the light and we said, oh yeah, he's working. See, the light bulb is there. In essence, it's called faith. And we have to understand that no matter what time we look up to the heavens, God is always at work. And you know, some of his greatest work is done in stillness and in the quiet of God. And so we're always looking for this big band. We're always looking for pomp and circumstance. We're always looking for the fireworks. And that's not always how God operates, is it? Because sometimes in his training ground, it's not a war zone. It's the quietness of faith. Look at the seventh verse. Joseph saw his brothers and recognized them, but he treated them like strangers and spoke roughly to them. Where do you come from? He said. And they said, from the land of Canaan to buy food. And Joseph recognized his brothers, but they did not recognize him. Stop right there for a moment. Joseph knew that God had been training him. I don't know about you, but maybe some of us in this room, once the brothers came back into our lives 20 years later, probably would have had some payback in our minds. I mean, you get mad over much worse. Raise your hand in here if you've had to wait too long for your order to come and you get upset about it. Go ahead, raise them up higher. There's no shame. There's no shame. There's the majority of people in here and the other people are lying. At least you're telling the truth. <laughs> At least you're telling the truth. Think about that. At least you're telling the truth. How many people have gotten mad at your spouse before? Just go ahead, raise your hand. 
Like, whoa, whoa, everybody, those hands went up super high. <laughs> Somebody in the back climbed up on a chair. <laughs> no, I'm just joking about that. But isn't it, isn't it something that his brothers come into the room and Scripture says he does speak harshly with them. He does speak harshly with them. But he's going to be leading them somewhere, not for punishment, but for education. He's going to be leading them into a moment of their lives to teach them to rely on God the way that he was taught. See, sometimes, listen to me, sometimes the best way to teach others is how you yourself were taught. And think about that. I mean, I may not be perfect, and I did not go to seminary, and I did not go to any college. I do not hold or boast any degree, but I do have a relationship with the Holy Spirit of God, and I can only teach you how he's taught me. And so don't ever make the enemy feel like you're not good enough. Listen, just teach how you've been taught. Look at verse 7 again. Joseph saw his brothers and recognized them, but he treated them like strangers and spoke roughly to them. Where do you come from, he said. And they said, from the land of Canaan to buy food. And Joseph recognized his brothers, but they did not recognize him. And Joseph remembered the dreams that he had dreamed of them, and he said to them, you are spies, and you have come to see the nakedness of the land. And they said to him, no, my Lord, your servants have come to buy food. We are all sons of one man. We are honest men, and your servants have never been spies. He said to them, no, it is the nakedness of the land that you have come to see. And they said, we, your servants, are 12 brothers, the sons of one man in the land of Canaan, and behold, the youngest is this day with our father, and one is no more. But Joseph said to them, it is as I said to you, you are spies. By this you shall be tested by the life of Pharaoh, you shall not go from this place unless your youngest brother comes here. Send one of you and let him bring your brother while you remain confined that your words may be tested whether there is truth in you or else by the life of Pharaoh, surely you are spies. And he put them all together in custody for three days. On the third day, Joseph said to them, do this and you will live for I fear God. If you are honest men, let one of your brothers remain confined where you are in custody and let the rest go and carry grain for the famine of your households and bring your youngest brother to me so your words will be verified and you shall not die. And they did so. Then they said to one another, in truth, we are guilty concerning our brother. Now listen to this, church. They said to one another, in truth, we are guilty concerning our brother in that we saw the distress of his soul when he begged us and we did not listen. That is why this distress has come upon us. And Reuben answered them, did I not tell you not to sin against the boy, but you did not listen? So now there comes a reckoning for his blood. And they did not know that Joseph understood them, for there was an interpreter between them. Joseph, Joseph puts his brothers in prison for three days, not only to teach them what it was like to be a prisoner, but also he wanted to give them time to think. The brothers were beginning to sense God was dealing with them due to their sins. Reuben mentions that fact. Listen to me, timeouts are not always bad. Timeouts are not always bad. I think as children, we're, we're, especially from the older generation, we grew up, timeouts were bad. Today's generation, timeouts like a trip to Disneyland in some of their rooms. They'd rather be there away from mom and dad. Who knows? But if you come up old school, you didn't want a timeout. You remember that? But let me just say this. Yeah. Timeouts are not always a bad thing in life. Let me try to put it on a much simpler level. In the sports world, coaches would love to have unlimited timeouts. How many of you have watched games on television and you say, oh, if we just had one more timeout, we could stop the clock? Why? 
Why do we want more timeouts? Because as I just mentioned, it stops the clock. A timeout can give your team a break, a much needed break. It can help get their legs back. It gives them time to breathe. Gives them time to catch air. Gives them time to get something to drink. It, it gives them a much needed rest. It gives them time to replan, reorganize. It gives them time to re-strategize after seeing the movements of their opponent in action. Calling a timeout can often cause the other team to lose momentum. Do not view your timeout in life as punishment, even if it is punishment, because sometimes timeout are punishment. But what we need to do, rather than hang our head in the moment, we need to move on. We need to suck it up. We need to move forward. We need to learn our lesson and press on in Christ. We need to get rested. We need to re-strategize by using the word of God and move on towards the victory of Christ in and for our lives. <clears throat> I can remember being in a state baseball tournament and the other team caught hot. And so as a coach, a smart coach, you call timeout, you walk as slow as you can to the mound. Why? Because once you get to the mound, you only have a certain amount of time, and they call you off the hill. And so what I would do is, I would just try to look for rocks on the field on my way out. Yeah, kick it out the way, we don't want the ball to hit that, safety for the players always in mind, get that off the field constantly taking time and you keep yourself there until the umpire comes up and says that's enough coach and then a smart coach acts like he can't hear him and some of those mound visits meant absolutely nothing sometimes on my way there I'm just thinking of something funny to say and some of my mound trips would consist like this. In the heat of a moment, winning or losing, you're just trying to keep it loose. And you just go to the hill and you look at the kid and you say, hey, you got a girlfriend? <laughs> hey, what's the last thing you ate? Or what are you going to do when you go home? Because even in the time out, we're just re-strategizing. Don't view it as punishment. View it as a time to get realigned in the word of God. And that's all you need, trust me. Look at verse 24. Then he turned away from them, and what, church? He wept. And so now, even though he's put his brothers in prison for three days, <clears throat> now his his heartstrings are getting hit. He just said a moment ago, he said, because I fear God, I'm going to let you go. Then he turned away, verse 24, from them, and he wept, and he returned to them and spoke to them, and he took Simeon from them and bound him before their eyes, and Joseph gave orders to fill their bags with grain, watch this, and to replace every man's money in his sack and to give them provisions for the journey this was done for them. And then they loaded their donkeys with their grain and departed. And as one of them opened his sack to give his donkey fodder at the lodging place, he saw his money in the mouth of his sack. And he said to his brothers, my money has been put back. Here it is in the mouth of my sack. At this their hearts failed them, and they returned trembling to one another, saying, what is this that God has done to us? And so now they're scared. Because now they're thinking, man, Joseph and Pharaoh are going to think that we stole the grain. They did not know that Joseph was the one that placed it back. In the 29th verse, when they came to Jacob, their father, in the land of Canaan, so here they've gotten home, they told him all that had happened to them, saying, the man, the Lord of the land, spoke roughly to us and took us to be spies of the land. But we said to him, we are honest men and we've never been spies. We are 12 brothers, sons of our father. One is no more, and the youngest is this day with our father in the land of Canaan. Then the man, the Lord of the land, said to us, By this I shall know that you are honest men. Leave one of your brothers with me and take grain for the famine of your household and go your way. 
bring your youngest brother to me. Then I shall know that you are not spies but honest men, and I will deliver your brother to you, and you shall trade in the land. And as they emptied their sacks, watch this, verse 35. As they emptied their sacks, behold, every man's bundle of money was in his sack. And when they and their fathers saw their bundles of money, they were afraid. And Jacob, their father, said to them, you have bereaved me of my children. Joseph is no more, and Simeon is no more, and now you would take Benjamin. All this has come against me. Then Reuben said to his father, kill my two sons if I do not bring him back to you. Put him in my hands, and I will bring him back to you. But he said, my son shall not go down with you, for his brother is dead, and he is the only one left. If harm should happen to him on the journey that you are to make, you would bring down my gray hairs with sorrow to Sheol. Jacob is still struggling with his past. And as I mentioned earlier, maybe there's some people here today that are in the same position. He feels as though he has now lost two children. Simeon's locked up, and he's in Egypt. Joseph, Jacob fears, is dead. Jacob's fear and his unwillingness to send back his sons is causing Simeon to remain in jail. That's the ugly thing about fear, isn't it? Because maybe there's things that you're battling with, maybe there's things that you're struggling with that are in your past, but it's still causing you and your family and your loved ones to live in fear. It can be so great in you, fear can be so great in you that when it affects how you live, when it affects the decisions that you make, others can be impacted. They are impacted not only by your decisions, but by your attitude and by your actions. You may think that you're the only prisoner, but truth is, the truth is, you're causing others to walk through the journey with you. And so what you're doing is, is that you've got nothing more than a prison chain gang. You may be at the front, but you are carrying a handful of innocent loved ones down the road of punishment with you. And this is what's going on with Jacob. Rather than live in the freedom, he's choosing to be gripped with fear. Genesis 43, verse 1. Now the famine was severe in the land, and when they had eaten the grain that they had bought from Egypt, their father said to them, go again, buy us a little food. But Judah said to him, the man solemnly warned us, saying, you shall not see my face unless your brother is with you. If you will send our brothers with us, we will go down and buy you food. But if you will not send him, we will not go down. For the man said to us, you shall not see my face unless your brother is with you. Israel said, why did you treat me so badly as to tell the man that you had another brother? And they replied, the man questioned us carefully about ourselves and our kindred saying, is your father still alive? Do you have another brother? What we told him was an answer to these questions. Could we in any way know that he would say, bring your brother down? And Judah said to Israel, his father, send the boy with me, and we will arise and go that we may live and not die, both we and you, and also our little ones. I will be a pledge of his safety from my hand. You shall require him. If I do not bring him back to you and set him before you, then let me bear the blame forever. And if we had not delayed, what's it say, church? We would now have returned twice. There had been such a delay from when they first returned with the grain from Egypt. Judah tells his daddy, hey, if we'd have left when we first got here, we could have been there and back twice already. Maybe the victory you're looking for could have already been if you just stepped outside your comfort zone and begin walking in faith. Maybe you already could have had what you're looking for. Maybe you already could have had what you're praying for. But you're so busy treating yourself like a prisoner and a captive that through faith you're not walking freely in Jesus Christ for your life. Imagine the tension at home. 
Remember, Jacob, Jacob's got, let me just run this down real quick. Jacob's got 12 children. Out of the 12 boys, how many wives does he have? Do you remember? Two. He's got two wives at home. And he's got four concubines. So here we have one man, six women, 12 boys. That's a busy house. They bring back, the 10 boys bring back enough grain from Egypt for their families to survive for a while. You could imagine the air was thick. The tension was thick. Everybody wants to talk dad uh, to dad about this, and everybody wants to talk dad into allowing him to go on this trip. But they know how their daddy feels about this. You know, the one thing that changes Jacob's mind is when the man runs out of food. Women, food can change the way he thinks, don't it? You know that one thing that you can cook up to make him smile. You know that one dessert. You know that one meat, that one meal. You know that one thing that's going to make that man happy again. And so here Jacob is. He's a defiant. No! I've already lost Joseph, and I'm not going to lose my, not my next youngest. It's a no! And then he runs out of food. And one of his sons says something that's so brilliant. He says, hey, you're worried about losing one son? If we don't go get food, your sons and your grandsons are all dying too. So what is it? What is it? What is it? We've all been in that boat. Maybe some of us are in that boat right now where we've just got to make a decision. We've just got to make our mind up. We've just got to say, you know what? It is what it is, and I'm stepping out because I'm tired of starving myself to death. I'm tired of living and treating myself like a prisoner. I'm just going to walk out of this jail cell and see what happens. I think one of the dangerous things about misery is, is that we can get so used to being miserable that it becomes our new comfortable. And the reason it becomes our new comfortable is because in the process of being miserable, we're constantly feeding ourselves things of the world to keep us feeling good about ourselves. And that's the dangerous thing about feeling good about being miserable because I take one thing of the world and I please my flesh and then when that wears off, I feel miserable again. And then I take something else of the world and I please my flesh and when that wears off, I feel miserable again. Anybody been there before? And it's this deadly, unending cycle and this is why we can remain in that prison door with the, with the cell open. We can re remain in the cell with the door open so long because we please ourselves while we're in there. We please our flesh while we're in there. We please our flesh while we're in there because nobody likes to feel bad on purpose and so we please ourselves with sin and there comes guilt and there comes pleasure temporarily and it's quickly fleeting. And maybe some folks in here today just need to stand up and walk out of the cell. Look at your neighbor and say, give it a try. <clears throat> we just need to give it a try. <clears throat> we just need to give it a try. Look at verse 11. <clears throat> Genesis 43, 11. This gets interesting. Because then their father Israel said to them, if it must be so, then do this. Take some of the choice fruits of the land in your bags and carry a present down to the man. A little balm and a little honey, gum, myrrh, pistachio nuts, and almonds. <clears throat> Here he is trying to win them over with food. Bring in some gifts. Take double the money with you. Carry back with you the money that was returned in the mouth of your sacks. Perhaps it was an oversight. Take also your who? Here it is. Ladies, if you want to change a man's mind, put him on a hunger strike. <laughs> Take also your brother and arise and go again to the man. May God Almighty grant you mercy before the man, and may he send back your other brother and Benjamin. And as for me, if I am bereaved of my children... I am bereaved. And so the men took this present, and they took double the money with them, and Benjamin, and they arose and went down to Egypt, 
and stood before Joseph. And when Joseph saw Benjamin with them, he said to the steward of his house, Bring the men into the house and slaughter an animal and make ready for the men are to dine with me at noon. And the man did as Joseph told him and brought the men to Joseph's house. And the men were afraid because they were brought to Joseph's house. And they said, it is because of the money which was replaced in our sacks the first time that we are brought in so that he may assault us and fall upon us to make us servants and seize our donkeys. And so they went up to the steward of Joseph's house, and they spoke with him at the door of the house. Now listen to what they said to the steward at Joseph's house. They said to him in verse 20, O oh my Lord, we came down the first time to buy food, and when we came to the lodging place, we opened our sacks, and there was each man's money in the mouth of his sack, our money in full weight, and so we have bought it again with us, and we have bought other money down with us to buy food. We do not know who put our money in our sacks. And so here, they're really making their case. Verse 23, he replied. So this is what the man at the door says. He replied, peace to you. Do not be afraid. Your God and the God of your father has put treasure in your sacks for you. I received your money. And then he bought Simeon out to them. Not only did the brothers, listen to me, not only did the brothers have to travel worried about their dad and his concerns, no doubt they were wondering how they would explain the issue of their money. This is the first thing on their mind when they get the opportunity to speak to someone. And so they're also traveling, concerned with the money that uh, they, they, they got back home within their sacks and they're bringing back. But they're also concerned about making sure that they get their brother Simeon out of jail and making sure that Benjamin is going to be kept safe and protected to head back home to their daddy. Look at the 24th verse, Genesis 43, 24. And when the man had brought the men into Joseph's house and given them water, and they had washed their feet, and when he had given their donkeys fodder, they prepared the present for Joseph's coming at noon, for they heard that he should eat bread there. And when Joseph came home, they bought into the house to him the present that they had with them and bowed down to him to the ground. Now here they are. What are they doing again? They're bowing down. And he inquired about their welfare and said, Is your father well, the old man of whom you spoke? Is he still alive? And they said, Your servant, our father, is well. He is still alive. And they bowed their heads and prostrated themselves. And he lifted up his eyes and saw his brother Benjamin, his mother's son, and said, Is this your youngest brother of whom you spoke to me? God be gracious to you, my son. Then Joseph hurried out, for his compassion grew warm for his brother, and he sought a place to weep. And he entered his chamber and wept there. And then he washed his face and came out. And controlling himself, he said, what church? Serve the food. Put yourself in Joseph's place for a moment, would you? Everything that had been done wrong to him, and he's still willing to forgive. What are you fighting this morning? What are you fighting letting go of? Who are you fighting to forgive? Listen, you could be justified in holding on, but it doesn't do you or them any good now, does it? Maybe they really did do you wrong. Maybe they really did do you dirty. Maybe they really did slander your name. But if you don't forgive, you don't receive the victory in the moment. You've got to forgive. Think of all the things that we did wrong before we came to Christ. Think of all the things that he washed us from, delivered us from, healed us from, forgave us of. And then think about all that he does even more now that we are saved in Christ. And he still forgives. Listen to me, church. Joseph forgave his brothers. Joseph forgave his brothers. Joseph was the one done wrong. And Joseph 
forgave his brothers. And see, this is what can happen when we get done wrong. We build up this defense and we take all of the evidence on how we did, got, how we were done wrong. Well, this was done and it shouldn't have happened. Well, this was done and that shouldn't have took place. This person acted like that and that's not good. If you act like that, you're not good. Who are we to build up a case against anyone? Who am I to build up a case against anyone? Who am I to hold someone else's grudge on what they've done? Who am I to hold anger and resentment in my heart towards another man or woman? Who am I to be angry at anyone? You may say, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the Bible says that there's a thing called righteous anger. Trust me, 99.9% .9 of the time, your anger is not righteous, it's sin. Trust me. Matter of fact, very few people have ever experienced the true definition of righteous anger. Simply because your righteous anger may have started out in sinful anger. Maybe it moved to be righteous, but it started out in sin. And so we have to be really careful justifying our feelings and our emotions. The Bible says that the heart of a man is sick. And this is why I need Jesus to rescue my heart. This is why I need Jesus to save my soul because I alone will never be good enough. Even when I receive Christ, I alone am never good enough. I need Jesus just as much today as I do the day I asked him into my soul to save my soul. When I asked him into my heart, I need Jesus every day of my life. And so do you. And I don't care how wrong the man was. I don't care how wrong the lady was. I don't care how bad they did you. I don't care how much they messed up your life. You're supposed to forgive them. You are supposed to forgive them. And I am supposed to forgive them. There's not a soul in this room that should be having a grudge on anyone. You say, oh my gosh, pastor, that's a bold statement. Well, let me tell you about the statement that Jesus makes. If I want to be forgiven, I've got to forgive myself. If I want Jesus to forgive me, then I've got to forgive other people. Dr. David Jeremiah said this, and I quote, maybe you heard of him, he's still preaching. Dr. David Jeremiah said this, Jesus says that those who live by God's forgiveness must imitate it. A person who only, whose only hope is that God will not hold his faults against him forfeits his rights to hold others' faults against them, unquote. You are to look at the forgiveness of Christ and you're to imitate it. What we cannot do is wave this Christian banner. For God so loved me that he gave Jesus to me and we forget that God so loved that man that you're hating right now. So you're to love the man that you hate. You're to love the woman that you hate. You're to love the person that did you wrong the same way that Jesus loves you right now. You say, but wait a minute, wait a minute. I need justice first. I need my justice. Well, if God had done justice on you, you'd have been blown off this earth like a flea that you are. Thank God he didn't put justice on us. Anybody thankful for mercy? Anybody thankful for grace? Anybody thankful for forgiveness? Anyone thankful for salvation? Who are we? Who are we to be angry at anyone? Because we used to be them. <gasps> no, I would never. I would never act the way that he acts. That's why I hate him. That's why I don't like him. That's why I want to see justice. Because I don't act like that. Oh, yes, that judgment is just as bad as his actions that you're judging him for. Oh, what a bad place to be in to think that you or I have the authority to judge anyone like that. Matter of fact, the table really should be flipped. We should love them so much that in our forgiving them, it should be enough to draw them to Christ, the way that Christ's forgiveness for us drew us to him. This is where it really comes down to. This is what it's really all about. 
If I could forgive a woman, if I could forgive a man, if I could forgive a group of people that so did me wrong, if I could just walk up to them and share with them that I forgive them, even if I don't want to, but I have to because Jesus has forgiven me of my filthy rags, and so since he's forgiven me, I've got to forgive you. What a testimony, right? What a testimony to someone. What a testimony in the power and the love of God. The anointing now has an opportunity to show up and wash that individual or individuals because you administered the love of God. And this is what Joseph's doing in this moment. Yeah, he could have been ugly. He could have been nasty. But thank God he wasn't. What he's really doing is kind of showing us a forerunner, if you will, of Jesus Christ. All of the wrong that they've done to me, I'm still going to forgive. One of the great statements you'll ever read is this. When Jesus said, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. Whew. No greater love that a man would lay down his life for another. And this is what we're guilty of. Of forgetting sometimes and I myself I myself I myself am guilty of forgetting this sometimes because I want to see justice sometimes before I want to see love anybody ever been there before <laughs> because here watch this see this is crazy this is crazy this is how we get manipulated in it because I want them to learn their lesson anybody, anybody want to teach someone a lesson before what would be the real lesson that they need Punishment, which makes a man hard, or love and forgiveness, which can save a soul. And then the self-righteous, the self-righteous in here would say, oh yeah, but a time out. He could get saved in time out. He could go to jail, and he could get right in jail. She could go to jail, and she could get saved in jail. Well, what's more important, you taking a hope that they get saved in jail, or you trying to lead them to Christ before they go? what's it all about for you is it about justification is it about teaching a lesson is it about punishment so that you feel better because someone did you or your family member wrong what's it really about or is it about the salvation status of a soul see because I've never witnessed and I've witnessed a lot of people I, I've been blessed to see thousands of people come to Christ and I've never seen one person come to Christ because someone was taking a hammer beating someone over the head with it I've never seen one person come to Christ in the form, in the text, and in the moment of current punishment. But I have seen and been blessed to see thousands of people come to the Lord in my lifetime by giving them the love of the gospel message of Jesus Christ. Yes, at times the Spirit will call me to point out what someone is doing wrong, but in the pointing out of the wrong, it always is followed up with the mercy and the forgiveness that God has for them. In other words, yes, you could be at the end of your road, you could be at the bottom of the barrel, but let me tell you about this man named Jesus who will redeem you, pick you up, wash you off, and save your life forever. That's what it comes down to. Remember, do not get away from the plan of God. What is the plan of God? For God so loved the world, say it with me, that he gave his only begotten son, so that whoever shall believe it in him shall not perish, but have what? Everlasting life. That's the plan of God. Don't get away from that. Don't get away from the mission of God. The plan of God is always Jesus, no matter who it is that you're looking at. It's always Jesus. What we cannot do is say, well, Jesus for everyone over here, but not those three people over there. They did some wrong stuff when they were, when they were in their 30s. Well, yeah, your 30s may have been some crazy years for some of you, but thank God you lived through it. Amen? What we cannot do is say, well, Jesus for 99% of people, but not the ones who really made me mad last year. No. Because they deserve corporate punishment. I think sometimes we forget that we did some things before we came to Christ that we could have got locked up for in the past. Yeah. 
I'm so grateful I never got caught as a teenager doing the crazy things that I was doing as a teenager with people that was much older than me that I had no business hanging out with. So thankful for that. And yes, someone could say, well, he broke into my home. He stole my things. He took from me. Put him in jail. And I'm so thankful for the mercy and the grace and the forgiveness of my father. See, what we begin to lose is the gift that we have as Christians to share Jesus with those who need it most. We should be so excited to go to that person that's been getting under our skin and share this present called Jesus. <laughs> we should be so excited about making a phone call when we get home today and say, you know what, girl? I have really been hating you. And I know it's no secret because of how I've been acting Post I've been putting on Facebook. I know you know I'm talking about you. The whole world does, girl. But you know, the pastor was talking, and the Holy Spirit was really convicting me. And I just need to tell you, I apologize. Because for God so loved the world, that means he loved not only me, but he loved you too. And that don't mean you got to be best friends with the girl. That doesn't mean you got to be best friends with a guy that you don't like right now because he did whatever to your family. It doesn't mean you got to go shoulder to shoulder with him, but what you do need to do is present the love of Jesus Christ because God has given you an opportunity in your training ground. See, this is where we miss it. We see it as a battle zone, and it's supposed to be training ground. We want to sling grenades because they hurt us. They hurt us. And I've justified all of this. I've justified my attitude and I've justified my way of thinking. And really, the only thing we need to be giving is Jesus. Everybody say Jesus on the count of three. Ready? One, two, three. Jesus! That's it. That's the medicine. That's the warfare. That's the Savior. It's Jesus. Ephesians 4.32, jot that down if you're taking notes. Ephesians 4.32 says this. We got it on the screen. Let's read it out loud together. One, two, three, go. Be, hope, stop right there. Too good to miss. Be what? See, this is what's so crazy about the person that is justified there being ugly to other people. They say, I am a kind person. I'm so nice to everybody else. This is how the enemy has duped someone into thinking. All right, here we go. Back at the beginning. One, two, three, go. Be. One another. Let's get the next one on the screen. Got the next one? Mark 11.25. Jot that down. Mark. 11.25. Here we go. Read it out loud. One, two, three, go. Keep that on the board for a little bit. Keep that up there for a minute. Let's just, let's just pick this apart right now for, for ourselves. And whenever you stand praying, and we're getting ready to do that in just a moment. I'm going to ask you to stand in just a moment. We're going to pray. So the moment of whenever is about to be now. All right? That way you don't put it off and say, well, I'll talk to God about this when I get home. <laughs> oh, God help you. And whenever you stand praying, tell your neighbor, that's now. What's it say to do? Listen, do you understand there's power in forgiveness? You, you can forgive someone else and you yourself be set free. They did the wrong. Maybe they really did do you wrong. But you have allowed the wrong that they done long time ago to still have an impact on your life right now. If you would just forgive and let all that go, it doesn't change the fact what they did, but it ain't going to control you no more. You're not going to walk around like crazy person. That's the truth. You'll be set free in your forgiveness. 
How many people remember when they got saved and they just felt like the weight of the world rolled off their backs? Hey, listen, listen, it's the same way, man. When you, when you forgive someone, it's just like, I mean, when you truly forgive someone, it's just like you took this big block of concrete off your head and your shoulders and you're just like, whoo, I'm not a prisoner no more. It's so funny, man. It's so, really, it's, it's sad. It's not funny. It's, it's so sad how we have caused ourselves to be a prisoner of something that someone else has done, and we've just justified ourselves in to be a prisoner. All right, let's read it again. Uh, and whenever you stand praying, what's it say do? Forgive for if you have what? Anything. Stop right there. Key word is what? Anything. Everybody say it again. Anything. Look at your neighbor and say anything. I mean, I'm telling you, anything. Doesn't matter if they backed into your mailbox. Doesn't matter if, if, if you saw them kick rocks at the end of your driveway. Doesn't matter if they, if they um, threw a rock into your window. Doesn't matter if they still have your chainsaw and haven't given it back yet. Doesn't matter if they lied about you. Doesn't matter if they said something to you. Doesn't matter if they ran over you with a truck or track and trailer. If you're still living, that's anything too. So yeah, yeah, but that's not the big things, Pastor. That's just talking about anything that's small. No! You're justifying your own sin. Anything. And when you understand that you have the power given by God to forgive people of anything, whoa. That means no one is going to have authority over your heart and mind anymore other than God himself. See, here's the sad thing. Maybe there's some people in this room that are living under bondage about another individual, and that other individual doesn't even care anymore. You're so wrapped up. You're so wrapped up into what they did, and they, just, they don't even care. And maybe that makes you even more mad. That makes you more spiteful. Oh, I don't like the fact that he doesn't care. He should care. He should care. He should care because it affects me. Yes, there's the problem, you. See, what you cannot do is go down to your grave with a burden in your life about someone else that has nothing to do with you at all. Don't give them the power anymore. They don't care. Listen to me. Let me just be a blessing and free you up. They don't care. Neither should you. Neither should you. Is that hard to do? Yes. But is it what you should do? Absolutely yes. So let's, let's look at it. And whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone so that your Father also, read it with me, so that your Father also who is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. How many people in this room want to be forgiven by God? How many people want to make it to heaven and on the day of judgment, God look at you and Jesus and the blood of Jesus be before you and God see you through the blood of the Lamb? How many people want to do that? Let me tell you why you want to do that. Because when you stand before the blood of the Lamb, all of your filthy rags are no longer seen by God. But let me tell you why. Because the blood of Jesus works. The blood of Jesus works. Now, if we don't want to stand before God Almighty and have our sins exposed, then why should we be so concerned about punishment and the exposure of other people's sins that have hurt us? See, what we do not want to do is get out of the plan of God. For God so loved the world means God loves everyone. Oh, yeah, but that sin was so bad that they did. No, 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 no. The world is a sinful place, and that's what it means when the plan of God says, for God so loved the world. Now, I'm going to ask you to go ahead and stand to your feet if you're able. And I'm going to give you the opportunity to forgive someone or something, or some people that you've been struggling with. A, because God tells you to. B, 
be because it's going to let you walk out of that jail cell. And C, because it's going to give you, it's going to give you such freedom in your life that maybe you've forgotten that you could even have. I want to read from you, read to you from the book of Matthew, chapter 6, the 14th and the 15th verse. And I want you to listen to this as I read it over you. Matthew, chapter 6, 14 and 15, Jesus says this. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But listen to me, church. Jesus says in the 15th verse, but if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Let's pray. Father, the very real truth is, and I pray everyone in this room understands it, is that unforgiveness can harden areas of our heart. Unforgiveness can cause us not to see the Father clearly. It can cause us not to think clearly. It can cause us not to hear clearly. And what we cannot do is so put off hearing from God because we're so longing for our own justice. It's time to just let it go. You see, the true justice that you're looking for actually shows up when you simply forgive. That's really what you need to hear today. The true justice actually shows up when you forgive. Because it was the same justice given to you by God. Through the forgiveness that Jesus Christ, his son, offers. Unforgiveness can cause your relationship with God to suffer. It can cause your relationship with God to weaken and it can cause your relationship with people in your community to eventually deteriorate. And so if you're holding on to any type of grudge or unforgiveness in your life, just let it go today. Father, I pray specifically for those right now that are holding on. God, that you would just, you would show them what it is to truly let go and forgive. Just right where you are, if you're holding on to something towards someone or some people, I welcome you right where you are. Just take your fist and hold it up in the air. No matter what it is, just hold it up. Just hold it up. Just hold it up. And we're going to do this symbolically. We're going to do this symbolically. Father, this thing that we're holding on to, God, we don't want it anymore. It's controlled us enough. It's made us bitter enough. It's made us angry enough already. It's hard in our hearts enough. We don't want it anymore. It's dangerously poisoned our minds in thinking that it was justified and okay to be in our hearts and be in our minds but we understand through the scripture today we don't want it anymore 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 God I pray that as we give this over to you we would truly experience victory in our lives as we forgive that man as we forgive that woman as we forgive those people as we forgive that spouse, as we forgive the circumstances, as we just forget it all, God, we're not going to let it control us anymore. And I pray that your people would experience the fullness of the victory of forgiving others. God, may we forgive the way we've been forgiven already. I just want you to take that thing that you're holding on to, friends, and I just want you to let it go. Let it go. And what you need to do when you walk out of here in just a moment, when you turn around and leave, you just need to leave it laying there. Don't look back. Lot's wife looked back, and you see what happened with her. She was destroyed because of it. Don't look back. Trust God to clean it up. 
If you really forgave the person, God will clean it up. Rejoice in that church. God will clean it up. God will do it. God will take care of it. Your job is just to let it go. In the name of Jesus, you just have to let it go. Resentment is let go. Anger is let go. The lies have been let go. Even the truth that hurt you has been let go. What they did has been let go. What they said has been let go. The actions have been let go. The fear has been let go. The resentment, the anger has been let go. The bitterness and the root of it has been let go. The root of all bitterness has been let go. Don't look back. Let God clean that up. Let the Holy Spirit minister to you. Let the Holy Spirit love on you. Let God do what only God can do. If you're here today and you've never asked Jesus Christ to be the Lord and Savior of your soul, I want to give you that opportunity right now. If you've never asked Jesus to save your soul and you're like, you know what, Pastor, I've heard what you said. I understand the power and forgiveness and I myself need to receive the forgiveness of God. Jesus says that he is the way, the truth, and the life and that no one comes to the Father except through him. I want you to hear this loud and clear. All roads do not go to heaven. All roads will not get you to God. Jesus Christ is the only way. And if you're ready to receive Jesus in your, in your heart today, if you're ready to follow Jesus right where you are, he will change your life forever. And I welcome you to just raise your hand if you've never done that before. And you say, you know what, Pastor, today I got to get saved, man. Today I got to know. Today I got to know. Today I got to know that my heart is right with the Lord. My heart is right with the Lord. Father, I, I thank you for your people. Bless them in their coming and in their going. And I thank you for the victory that we have in forgiveness. In the precious name and in the blood of Jesus Christ, all God's children said together, amen. amen. Let's give God a clap of praise. He's worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy. I love you. Let me just tell you something before you go.